the first 48 hours of the recovery were just, you know, kind of a blur. It's hard to prepare for that. But the immediate focus was on the archive and trying to just get as, as much material out of the archive as possible. The first thing was stabilizing. Everything had come in in just these movers boxes, the cardboard boxes. Some of them were still soaking wet. So it was isolating different types of collections from each other, you know, uniforms from paper, from photographs, and laying everything out. The biggest damage was to our woodwork. Uh, the woodwork was already uh, a lot of it was extremely old. Some of it was original when the building was first built. The labor has been intensive to try to get these materials back together and back uh, as a, an exhibit again. And really, we're still working on that. And there's quite a bit more work to be done. We didn't recover any of the books. I thought we would be able to save some of the books on the top shelves, but he looked at them and I could say, were they already moist and wet and molded? He said no, that he didn't think anything, that we could not use them. We had moments of despair on the first day because I thought, well, well this is all over with. We're never going to be able to do any of this again. And when I voiced some of that shock and concern, um, I realized that it fell really hard on my, my guys who were in recovery. I got a hold of myself really quickly and said, all right, wait, we need to take another approach here. Take a shovel and let's get this, let's get this cleaned up. Where do you begin? That may feel like a daunting task when you're in the midst of a natural disaster, but hopefully after today's session, you might be a step closer to planning ahead to know exactly where to begin. I'm Bill Goodman, Executive Director of Kentucky Humanities, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Disaster Preparedness Online Series. We're pleased you've taken the time to join us for this important program, focusing on disaster response and the basic needs to consider as you develop an emergency preparedness plan. This series is made possible with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our thanks as well to our many partners, including Performing Arts Readiness, the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation, the Kentucky Historical Society, Kentucky Arts Council, the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives, and finally, to the men and women who have shared their remarkable real-life stories. We appreciate how your experiences will help others to learn about the importance of disaster preparedness. Now, I'll turn it over to our instructors for this session, Jan Newcomb, Elena Gregg, and Tom Clarison. Well, thank you, Bill. And I'm Jan Newcomb. I'm executive director of the National Coalition for uh, Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, which we affectionately call NCAPER. And I also work with uh, my colleague, Tom Harrison, as the performing arts coordinator for uh, the Performing Arts Readiness Project. And I will now turn it over to Elena to introduce herself and then Tom. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Elena Gregg, the Emergency Programs Manager for the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation. And I'm Tom Clareson, Project Director for Performing Arts Readiness, based in Ohio, so I'm close by to Kentucky. So now we'll begin the PowerPoint. Wonderful. Uh, and I just want to thank all the wonderful colleagues at the Kentucky Humanities who have been really 
very thorough in, in prepping us for, uh, for these webinars. And uh, it's really important information. And so it's nice to have a combination of humanities and arts together in, in helping people respond to disasters and emergencies. Um, so today's title of our webinar is the Initial Response, First 48 Hours. And as you can see from those opening uh, videos and conversations, how devastating it is. And it's almost like, what do I do? And so we're gonna talk about that today to try to give you some pointers on, on what, what you can do at, at the onset, well, after, just after a, a, a disaster. And please know on the next slide, we have our names and contact information. And we are here, to, this is what we do. And we want to help you in any way. There are no stupid questions. There are um, uh, just, uh, we want to help and to help you prepare and to be ready for when the next uh, disaster strikes. And what we do know is that there will be another disaster. It, it's when rather than if. So on the next slide, we have our first poll question, which I'd like you to all answer. Do you have experience responding to a disaster, either at your institution or in your home? And this can be any time during your life, if you would all answer that. And I will look at the uh, percentage of yes and no on that question. And um, later as we, if you have questions throughout our presentation, feel free to use the Q&A for your question. Um, we're going to use the chat in another way when Elena does a tabletop exercise. So now we have, okay, we have 65% of you, yes, you have experienced responding to a disaster and 35% of you have not, the, the lucky 35% have not yet experienced that. Uh, so the question two, if you have previously responded to a disaster, did you feel adequately prepared to respond? And this is important because we can all go through things, but oftentimes, uh, we don't take the time to debrief afterwards, especially organizations. And that's really part of the process that we're, we're going to be talking throughout the series of webinars is, is having that time to really think, how could we have done better? How could we have responded? In a different way, would it have helped? So we'll see the results for 27% um, of you felt adequately prepared to respond. And 73 uh, did not. So uh, I, I think that really, really uh, focuses what we're, the importance of what we're gonna be talking about today. So now I will go to the next slide and let Elena take over and talking to you about a tabletop exercise. Thank you, Jan, and hi again, everybody. Um, so we thought it would be helpful today to begin the session with a tabletop exercise. Mind you, it will be a much abbreviated version um, to kind of get you in the headspace of what you might encounter when you are first responding to a disaster and things that you should think about when approaching a disaster response. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with the tabletop exercise, as defined by David Carmichael, who is the state archivist for Pennsylvania, a tabletop exercise is a group discussion based on a hypothetical scenario that develops and changes throughout the discussion. Participants explain how they would react as the scenario unfolds and morphs. Tabletop exercises are effective at testing existing plans. So typically tabletop exercises take anywhere from one to three hours, depending on how involved they are. Um, the general outline is introducing a disaster scene and then kind of going through how you would approach the scene and then 
answering different injects, which are kind of changes in course. Um, and the whole goal is to identify gaps in your disaster preparedness. So if you have a plan, it's seeing, oh, we didn't think that we should contact the insurance adjuster, or, oh, we didn't know that we should incorporate a vendor maybe to help get water out of this space. So things that you might not have thought about in order to you know, better improve your preparedness. So for today, we're going to do, as I said, a very abbreviated version. I'm going to show you one image and we're going to, I'm going to prompt several questions. Um, so in a, right now, <laughs> I'm going to show you uh, an image of a library and then just one second for the poll question. Um, and then I'm going to describe the scene and then ask you questions that will um, elicit different responses. So here we have a library. Um, it is Monday morning and you head to your workplace earlier than usual to check on your collections because there was a pretty intense storm that came through on Sunday evening. You walk into your institution and this is what greets you. There appears to be several inches of flood water on the floor and hundreds of volumes of books strewn about. Um, I'm curious for before we begin the polls, um, if you all could use the chat function and make sure that the uh, when you hit send, it's to everybody. Um, if you could share some initial observations that you see, um, just curious what your first thoughts are. And I will read them out as they come in. Um, while you all get your thoughts together, I'll, I'll just state, I think um, seeing this many books is overwhelming. Um, I'm curious about the stability of the shelves. Um, yes, is the building safe? cannot initially enter the space, people are saying in the chat. Um, some one person wrote, I am now retired, good luck to the next person. Um, the shelves are still standing, seem unstable, electrical issues, look for injured staff. I need a refrigerated truck. Yep, these are all great first observations. How safe is the area? Have an expert examine the space. This is awesome, great. Um, so we can launch poll question three. Um, so for this question, what is your first reaction? So some of you have already shared in the chat, but I'm curious of the following three options, what would you select? A, begin triaging damage collections right away. B, walk into the space to check out the extent of damage. Or C, inform facilities and maintenance staff about what you've encountered. Um, please make your selection. And then if you could expound on your choice in the chat, that would be really helpful. And I will give you all a few seconds to answer that. I see in the chat, do we have the tools to clean up or do we need to call someone to help? Yep, these are great first thoughts as well. Safety, I'm seeing a lot of people regarding or including concerns about safety. All right, so in the poll, we received 0% for A. 17% for B, which again was walk into the space to check out the extent of damage, and 83% of you selected C, inform facilities and maintenance staff about what you've encountered. Um, it's important to recognize that we all, I think, have been in situations where we want to dive in and start the work right away, but it's very important that you are calling outside support, even within your own institution, right away to get a second opinion to make sure this, the space is safe, to kind of see different things that you might not be seeing right away. Um, as you all mentioned in the chat, there might be live wires on the ground. You don't know what's in the flood water. You don't know if those shelves are unstable. If you walk in, they could collapse. So you wanna keep yourself safe. You wanna keep your team safe. And so informing facilities and maintenance right away is gonna be helpful to get that outside perspective and to help you make an informed decision. Um, all right, so we are going to launch poll question four. Let me just catch up on the chat real quick here. Great. Thank you all for your responses. These are really, really good. Um, okay, so poll question four. You are wearing shorts, sandals, and a short sleeve top, but you want to begin retrieving collections immediately. What do you do? A, proceed with wearing what you have on. Time is of the essence and collections need to be evacuated ASAP. B, head home to change into more protective clothing, including closed-toed boots. 
C, proceed with what you have on in order to begin the work, but get in touch with staff coming in to make sure they have protective clothing on. D, look into what additional personal protective equipment or PPE you should have on your person, for example, a half-face respirator before entering, entering the flooded space. Or E, E is B and D, so both B and D. So go ahead and make your selections. Um, and you can, again, expound on your choices in the chat if you'd like. Give you a few seconds here to select. All right. It looks like we've got some responses in. So D, so eight. 8% of you selected D, which was look into what additional protective equipment, PPE, you should procure. And 92% selected E, which is B and D. Um, so it is very important when you are approaching a disaster scene to assess your own person and to see how you might be vulnerable to the space that you're entering. Um, again, it is it is really tempting to start the work right away, but unless you are prepared, you're gonna put yourself and your team at risk entering a space like this. So it's important to cover your skin. So wearing protective clothing, especially important to cover your feet. So making sure you have closed toed shoes or boots on. Um, and because we don't know what contaminants are in this space, looking at different PPE and what's available is gonna be really helpful to protect yourself. Um, so that could be, using a half face respirator, using an N95 mask if you are, if you have been fit tested for an N95, um, maybe looking at a Tyvek suit or something to protect your clothing, um, looking at safety goggles, so different items that are gonna protect your person and keep you safe. Um, and I'm wondering if you all could put in the chat some other examples of PPE or protectiveness that you could put on your person when you are approaching a scene like this. Gloves, great, thank you. Hard hat, yep, very good. Masks, gloves, yep, seeing a lot of head and uh, hand protection, headlamps, goggles, shoe covers, absolutely. Um, there are Tyvek suits and there's also Tyvek shoe covers or Tyvek suits that cover your feet as well. So lots of options for protecting your, your person. Okay, and now uh, walking scaffold, uh-huh. Okay, depending on the size of space and how many people are present, walkie talkies, yeah. So personal protective equipment can extend to means of communication. So how are you going to connect to other people on staff? Um, how are you gonna know what everybody's up to and where people are? Um, also, it's important to note here, um, sharing this information with the people that are responding with you, so making sure that they are prepared as well and that they have thought about what sort of clothing and uh, footwear sh they should be wearing is important. Sign in, sign out protocols for entering the scene, absolutely. Um, okay, and so moving right along, uh, you quickly realize that the extent, oh, sorry, back to, it's not done with the tabletop yet, sorry. <laughs> um, you quickly realize that the extent of damage exceeds what your staff can handle, and you may need to call an outside support to help triage collections and get the water out of the space. I'm curious if you could share in the chat different vendors that you might want to call or different people, community members, outside vendors, just different examples of people that you could call to support the incoming response. Yep, vendors such as Surpro. Mm -hmm. Belfour, yeah, BMS Cat, absolutely. Professional cleanup crews, flood cleanup companies, yep. Um, State Library to see, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Use local resources. They probably have other lists of people compiled. Um, utility companies, absolutely. Local search and rescue, Alliance for Response, love it. Yes, absolutely. If you have a network in your region, this is a perfect opportunity to tag them. Um, oftentimes, with especially with isolated flooding events, um, some institutions will be impacted while others may not. So if people are able to help out, they often will. So call on your neighbors to help you out. 
Yep. Okay. Great responses. Thank you, everybody. Let's see. Local CERT. Yes. Historic Society volunteers. Awesome. All right. Um, so there you have it. A rapid fire tabletop exercise. Um, this is something that I think is really helpful once you kind of go through the disaster planning process with your institution. Implementing a tabletop on a yearly or more frequent basis is really helpful. Um, we have a lot of resources to support folks that want to do a tabletop. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, happy to share ways to, to do this at your own institution. But thank you all for your engagement. Um, we're gonna move on to some other resources that can help with response. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you so much. So in the last webinar, we I spoke about the National Heritage Responders and promised that I would share more information during this session since they are often involved in response and recovery efforts. So here we are. Um, first, I'm gonna share a little information about who they are and then give some examples about ways they've been involved in response and recovery efforts with institutions all over the country um, to share ways that they could help you all as well. Um, so the volunteer corps is comprised of over 100 active and reserve volunteers. They're located all over the country and specialize in a wide variety of things very much intentionally. Um, so for example, we have two volunteers that are in Hawaii now and they are able to help with the wildfire responses that are ongoing. Um, so anyway, they are, when we bring volunteers into the volunteer corps, we look at what they do and where they're located. We do this so that when calls and inquiries come into the group, we often have somebody that's located at least near them and has the expertise that they're looking for. Um, they've been involved in quite a few deployments over the years. And just for a brief history, the group was formed in 2007 um, after Hurricane, not Irma, sorry, Katrina in 2005, uh, there was a realization that there needed to be a disaster response core that was dedicated to cultural heritage. Um, so due to, thanks to an IMLS grant that FAIC received, we were able to establish our first volunteer corps in 2007. It was 65 people. And then in 2011, we brought in about 40 additional people. Um, since 2021, we've brought in an additional 40-ish people, about 43, I think, to be exact. Um, and the group continues to grow and evolve. Um, so they have been involved in large-scale responses, such as those uh, related to different hurricanes over the years. Um, they've also been involved in flooding responses, uh, such as those that just occurred in Kentucky over the past year. Um, and in terms of what NHR volunteers can help with, um, they're quite skilled at assessing. So when collections have been impacted and um, folks need help assessing damage, they're great at assessment. Um, they're also quite skilled at training institutional staff in foundational collections emergency response and providing training for how to go about the triage process. Um, they also serve as sounding boards for next steps. So I know that after disaster, it can be a difficult time to think of all the different things like we just discussed in the tabletop, all the different things that you need to be considering in terms of next items. Um, NHR volunteers can be that calm third party presence to kind of walk you through next items. And then they also can clean impacted collections. Um, we are very intentional about who we send to what deployment. Um, so if we know that volunteers are gonna be working on book and paper materials, we'll make sure that we send people with book and paper experience. Um, and so everybody is tailored to whatever collections they're gonna be working on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here you can see a few examples of volunteers working. These are from 2012. Um, so on the left, you can see volunteers disinfecting impacted shelving. Um, on the right, you can see one of our volunteers helping to clean debris from an impacted uh, art object that was involved in a flooding event. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see a widespread drying effort. Um, this was also in 2012. And you see that our crew is using outdoor space. It's using natural air to provide better circulation. 
Um, you see one volunteer in the background wearing a full Tyvek suit. Um, so we have creative ways to approach different situations, especially when it comes to drying collections. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings me to Kentucky. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to share a few examples of ways that our volunteers have been involved in Kentucky over the past year. Um, so we were able to deploy three different teams to Whitesburg and Hindman, Kentucky between November, 2022 and March, 2023. Um, here you can see photos of our first deployment team that was in Whitesburg in November, 2022. Uh, this was our first in-person deployment since 2019, since we suspended activities for the first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this team helped Apple Shop uh, clean over 500 quarter-inch audio tape reels. Um, and they also trained staff to continue the work when they left uh, to be able to train additional volunteers. Next slide, please. Our second deployment was the first week of March. Um, and this involved a team also deployed to Whitesburg and helping out uh, Apple Shop. Here, they were able to create a desiccant chamber to help dry collections quicker. Um, and they came up with this on site. So they're just an incredibly creative bunch. And in this group, we had an architectural conservator, um, a book and paper conservator, and an objects conservator. So we had different perspectives that were able to help inform how they were going to help. Um, and then our third deployment, uh, that was to Heinemann, Kentucky, and that involved helping Heinemann Settlement School and the Appalachian School of Luthery. And this was a deployment that we did in conjunction with the Association for Preservation Technology, or APT. Um, they are a group that also has a volunteer corps called the Disaster Response Initiative, or DRY, which I think is very clever. Um, and they are comprised primarily of structural engineers and uh, architects. So they have the structural perspective um, that is really helpful. So we were able to bring one of their volunteers and an undergraduate student who hopes to go into structural engineering, specifically focused on historic properties. Um, and they were able to work with one of our volunteers who is an architect to do structural assessments. And then the rest of our volunteers were able to work with um, a large group of volunteers from the Sons of the American Revolution um, to help dry impacted materials. Um, so the, the scope of what NHR can support is quite broad. Um, they are really wonderful. They're most accessible through phone and email. Um, but since the COVID-19 pandemic, we also have built out our virtual assessment abilities. So if you want to video to video chat or Zoom with them and kind of show different collections and get their insight, that is a possibility as well. Um, so if anybody has questions about NHR, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to discuss more about them. Um, next slide, please. So we also wanted to be sure we discuss the incident command system today with you all, because this is quite a helpful tool when it comes to disaster response. Um, so ICS is, in short, it's a system that is a standardized on-scene, all-risk incident management concept. So it establishes five functional areas of management for major incidents. There's command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. Um, so it's this adaptable structure that can kind of just come into play when you are going through a disaster to organize staff and people that are involved in your response in a very clear manner. Um, I know that for cultural heritage professionals, this system can oftentimes feel abstract because we don't necessarily or inherently use it in our day-to-day -day work. Um, but there is a book called Implementing the Incident Command System at the Institutional Level that I realize this is also by David Carmichael and I quoted him earlier. I'm clearly a big fan, um, but this is a great handbook for using the system and applying it to your institution. Um, so he kind of breaks down what ICS is and how to use roles that are typically at an institution to apply them to the structure. Um, I cannot say enough positive things about ICS. It's really handy. Um, I know that 
emergency management nerds will use this to like plan a birthday party because it's so helpful. Um, but here it is. Um, and then FEMA also has a free course called IS100 that is accessible. Anybody can take it. It takes usually a few hours to complete, but if you really want to see the like nuts and bolts of the incident command system and further understand this process, highly recommend taking it, um, just spending the time to go through it. All right, I'm going to hand it back over to Jan. Okay, on our thanks, Elena. That's really informative. Even though I've been working with this for a while, it's I'm always learning from uh, from uh, the others. Uh, okay, here is a photograph that some of you may recognize. It's a, a theater in Mayfield, Kentucky, with the seating somewhat intact. However, the wall behind the stage is completely missing. And this was after the horrific tornadoes in uh, 20, 2021, I believe that was it, towards the end of the year, yes, December 10th through 11th. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about HENTEF, another acronym. It stands for Heritage Emergency National Task Force. Caper is a member of HENTEF, but there are hundreds Members of organizations throughout the country with uh, who have the interest of, of making sure our cultural heritage and arts organizations and artists are uh, helped bring emergencies. So coordination, collaboration, and communication are the three C's of, of HENTEF, and they, they coordinate the collection and sharing of incident-specific information with cultural stewards, first responders, and also emergency managers in order to protect our cultural resources. So it, in the, the photo shows um, that this theater was obviously uh, devastated. And so what did Hentef do and how did it help? How, how did the people of Hentef help uh, in Kentucky after this? Uh, incident, and uh, I thought it was interesting that they they called this a no notice event. Interesting, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's, it's kind of a very uh, subdued way of talking about such a horrific disaster, but that's what they call it because they had no no uh, notice uh, before it happened. So the action Hentef starts with outreach to state arts and cultural agencies. And the usual suspects are the state museum, state library, and state archives. Who has suffered damage? What are the impacts? Where is the need? What is needed? Um, and then this is also, most of us who are members of HENTEF get this information as the information is coming through and saying, this theater has lost you know, the back of the building. And uh, we start getting information like that to figure out how we can help and res respond quickly. And so it includes state arts councils, humanities councils, and tribal entities, and state parks. And of course, the state FEMA, or the FEMA uh, of the state. And the, this information is shared with response entities at FEMA, as well as other federal agencies. HENTEF will often convene a coordination call with 62 members, state and federal agencies. But for Western Kentucky, it was NCAPER who took the lead in convening these calls, working closely with uh, people on the ground and those people with affected institutions. And then HENTEF followed up with impacted institutions in Bowling Green, Mayfield, and other cities and towns offering guidance and, and connecting cultural stewards and subject matter experts from HENTEF's members, from painting conservators to structural engineers, just as Elena was talking about. So HENTEF is a really important entity. It is run by FEMA and, and the Smithsonian. It's a, it's a um, dual, dual 
boss kind of, uh, of or Lori Foley, who is the HENTEF uh, executive director. And on our next call, I mentioned response calls. Our next slide, excuse me. Um, and Caper has been doing, uh, in moments of crises, artists and creatives often bear the brunt, yet their resilience is essential for our communities. So and Caper offers both ex expertise and empathy in time of, of disaster. In the days and weeks after it, communications and IT are often cut off or limited. And artists and cultural workers may be displaced and arts leaders may be scrambling to figure out how to help their constituents and colleagues. So what we do is we send out um, to state and local arts leaders essential guidelines for arts responders organizing in the after, aftermath of disaster on how to help and support your local artists. It's, it's a PDF that we send out and it really, helps to focus people on what can I do? How can I help? And, and uh, it's used as a, a primer for state and local arts councils and arts service organizations. And the response calls are generally held at the same time and day, either weekly or bi-weekly. And they are guided by those affected on, and are open to anyone who wishes to participate. NCAPER brings its National Service um, Steering Committee members onto these, these uh, response calls so they can hear firsthand what is going on on the ground and what are the needs. And you see in the second bullet, in recent years, we've facilitated calls over many states. I mean, the Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands calls went on for over one year. Now, Western Kentucky and then Eastern Kentucky it was about four or five calls and then things kind of took off and uh, our phone calls, our re response calls were not needed as much, but we kept still in touch with, with the um, Arts Council and, and um, others affected. So, uh, that just says a little bit about what NCAPER does in the immediate response time after disaster. And just so you know that, that we're always here to help and um, all you have to do is, is contact us if we haven't contacted you. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Tom, who's going to talk about other um, personal protective equipment. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself there. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A, and so I'm going to take an opportunity because it might uh, sort of be uh, an ending point for some of the things that uh, Jan has been talking about. And uh, one of the questions definitely is a leap into what I'm going to be talking about. But um, let me take these sort of in order from how they've been covered so far. Um, we had one question, how can you become an NHR member? Um, and Elena, if you would field that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so historically, you had to attend one of FAIC's um, NHR trainings to become a volunteer, but now we've kind of expanded it a bit. Um, so if you attend any of FAIC's regional trainings, so those are typically coordinated with Alliance for Response Networks around the country. Um, if you have attended any of those, you are eligible to join. Um, also, if you have attended a HEART program training, HEART includes training, the acronym, and I always say HEART training, but it's Heritage Emergency and Response Training, and that is administered through FEMA and uh, the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. The goal of that program is to empower individuals to share um, disaster response knowledge with their institutions. Um, so after folks have completed that um, kind of mission through HEART, they would be eligible to join NHR as well. So there's two different routes into the group. Um, after completing a training, there's a test. It's about a 40 multiple choice question test um, that folks have to take. And then we enter people into what we call the eligible volunteer pool. Um, then each 
February, between February and May, we look at our roster. We identify any gaps that we have. So either states that don't have NHR volunteers or specialties that we need better representation on. Um, and we will look at our eligible volunteers and then pull from there. So every year we onboard at least, I mean, at a at the bare minimum, three people. So between like three and six people. Um, so yeah, we if you have more questions about it, reach out. I can kind of go through the different steps, but it's also outlined on our website if you want to check that out. Okay. Thank you, Elena. Um, the next one is related to the end of uh, Jan's part of her presentation, and it's how do we set up an NCAPER response call, and is there a specific person to contact? And our specific person will answer that question. Yes, I, 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 uh, I would be the one, but really you can reach out just to, uh, to anybody, even write to me on, on the website or contact me. Our, always aware of what's what's going on and oftentimes we're trying to build the roster and have state and uh, uh, state and local uh, activation teams already in place so that I know if something hits Louisiana I can get on board with the uh, Jean over in, in Homa and uh, Renee and you know all these uh, local arts uh, leaders so yes reach out and um, we also have grant makers in the arts who will uh, contact uh, funders in the area. So uh, just shout out and we'll be there and happy to, to facilitate post. And I want to give a, a shout out to Jan, actually, for the work that uh, she was doing, particularly in um, Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, those calls were going on, as she said, for a year. Um, oftentimes, the call would go on for 90 minutes to two hours, even though we try to usually keep them to an hour. And it was a lifeline. And in many cases, it's a lifeline when these type of calls happen. Um, there is one more question, uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is maybe one that uh, Elena and I can share. Uh, it's should we keep a stock of PPE on hand in case of an emergency, and do items expire? And uh, with that, I would say, yes, it's a good idea to keep that stock of PPE on hand. And um, a number of things that uh, Elena talked about and I've got right here on my slide are things that you should keep uh, and uh, have in a safe area, have them high off the floor, um, you know, make sure that they don't get soaked uh, or carried away by flooding um, as uh, things are going on, uh, but they do expire. Um, many of the the types of uh, supplies that we're going to be talking about, whether they're PPE or uh, book, paper, and textile uh, supplies uh, do expire. So you want to check to see how long those will last. You know, some of the gloves that you might la use, the, the plastic or nitrile gloves, uh, your hand might go through them if they've been around for five years. Um, so uh, you need to watch that and see what the, what the scoop is with that. Elena, any other uh, opinions on uh, the uh, that question? Yeah, I would also suggest if you have other supplies on site for everyday actions to keep your stuff for emergencies separate so it's not tempting to tap into that. Um, so keep it in a bin elsewhere so that you know that that is just for the purpose of responding um, or recovering after a disaster. That, that is really good. Thank you very much. And um, that's something I'll uh, sort of uh, come back to uh, toward the end of my part of the presentation. I also wanted to mention something as um, standard as flashlight batteries. Uh, those are the things that probably uh, wear out most quickly and can cause the most trouble. I actually had a, uh, this was a, a, anything with a battery in it is susceptible to this. I had an environmental monitor to check out uh, the temperature, relative humidity, and light readings uh, in organizations that I used most of the time when doing a site assessment, not during a disaster, but sometimes would go on site to a disaster with. And I opened it up right 
right before I had to do a disaster and the batteries had leaked all over the place. So along with the fact that it wasn't going to work, it was also a little bit of a danger to me because I didn't want to get covered in battery acid. So you need to check that kind of thing out as you can. So I want to give a few more details. Elena covered uh, a lot of this, and uh, really all of you covered a lot of this in a really great way um, when you were doing the tabletop exercise, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about this PPE. Um, and I think when you're thinking about response, review what your organization has in the way of protective equipment for staff as well as reviewing if anyone has health issues that may prevent them from helping with recovery. Um, one of the things that we uh, see here is some masks li uh, listed. And, you know, after, uh, especially during and after the pandemic, it was very difficult to get any of the N95 or N100 masks. So it's going to be doubly important to be planning ahead to ensure that Anyone who's going to be working on site has some form of respiratory filtration for dust and mold, for other uh, things that are in the air when a disaster kicks them up, whether that could be through a half face uh, respirator with appropriate cartridges or basic dust masks. So really, this will mean that you need to be real selective with who on your staff works on response and recovery. And I wanted to just tell you about a story here. I worked in Texas a number of years ago and there was a tornado and one of the librarians uh, whose building was hit um, stayed on site for about 72 hours uh, to monitor what was going on, to make sure that the disaster recovery companies who came in uh, were um, uh, getting things out in order and tending to the building and the collection. And she unfortunately was not wearing any type of respiratory covering. And she ended up being hospitalized, ended up missing the next 14 days of the recovery after she was there on site without any of this equipment on. So that was really, for me, a, a sort of a true life story, a first person story of what you need to, to look out for. Um, if you're looking for people to be working on response and recovery long term, one thing that I would say is ask them to get fit tested for any respiratory equipment that they might be able to use. And this can be done at a hospital. Many local hospitals will be able to do fit testing for respirators. Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, conservators who are members of um, the American Institute for Conservation and who uh, Elena can put you in touch with through the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation, um, they can help uh, at some of the conservators meetings. Uh, there's an annual fit test that people are able to go through because it is important to do that. Uh, our faces change. Uh, for some of the, the, the men in the audience, you might decide between one year and another that you'll have a beard. That's going to completely change the fit of any kind of respirator. So uh, you need to think about that. Um, some other things, gloves. Leather, definitely important for heavy cleanup. Um, it can be things with leather reinforced palms. Uh, nitrile for hand and handling collections is important. Um, the eye protection, and this was something that came up left and right in our discussion uh, during the tabletop, uh, eye protection is extremely important. And uh, a couple of Elena's pictures showed people who are in Tyvek coveralls, Tyvek aprons, um, you know, uh, those things work very well for us to mail things across the country and ship things across the country. They also are really good for keeping particulates, mud, dirt uh, off of us, and um, they're really tough uh, to be able to utilize when you have a disaster and you're involved in this kind of thing. So just uh, a couple more things to add to what Elena and all of you said in the PPE area. The next slide is going to talk a little bit about working with vendors. And what I wanted to say here is definitely name recognition is not enough. Um, when we talk about disaster response vendors, uh, we need to consider companies that are skilled at recovering everything from books and records to uh, for arts organizations, props, costumes, and other materials that we might want to be recovering along with our buildings. So 
for disasters involving collections of whatever type, you want to contact companies who have this experience. And we have a couple of them listed here. And it was really wild to see in the chat, these were popping up left and right because I think people uh, utilize them in uh, the Western Kentucky tornadoes and the Eastern Kentucky uh, uh, flooding. But we have uh, Belfour, we have Blackman Mooring Steamatic Catastrophe and Polygon. All of these are services that do vacuum freeze drying. All of these are services that have handled and worked with for years, um, library and archival collections. Um, they're some of the vendors who were called in on many of the situations that Elena had in her list that NHR people uh, went to and that Jan uh, had on her list when she was talking about the uh, various uh, times that uh, there needed to be uh, some on-site activity after a disaster happened in the arts world. So I think you need to consider what services you're going to need and what services the vendors offer. And these are questions that should be asked well before an incident happens. I want you to actually think strongly about the idea of uh, getting in touch with some of these organizations now and saying, you know, uh, for those of you who were affected by some of the disasters in Kentucky in 21 and 22, uh, you probably have been talking with folks. But uh, if not, talk with them and say, uh, you know, we want to talk with you about where we store our business records and our historic archives. Um, we need to be able to salvage a costume collection to get back in business at our arts, arts organization more quickly. Uh, we have a prop storage area and a props creation area. How do we get that back open? And once you determine the needs to cover the different types of materials in your collection, I think you can find vendors who can help you or conservators who can help you specifically with some of these areas. So by far, the best time to contact a vendor or any vendors is prior to any disaster. I really want to emphasize that. Response and recovery happen a lot more quickly if you've already met with the vendor and gotten onto their preferred uh, customer list. That means they have visited your site. They know who you are, what you have, and what your facilities are like inside and out. And, you know, there have been storms when I've been looking at the Weather Channel and I see one of these organizations' trucks there and they're right at the border or right at the, the town limit getting ready to go in when the declaration is made that they can. And that is because some of the organizations have a good existing relationship with the vendor and they have called them and said, as soon as you can get here, please do. Um, so when making the contact, be sure not to only answer the vendor's questions, but ask your own questions. Like, what kind of experiences do you have with your type of institution, your library, archive, historical society type of institution? Um, what collections uh, do uh, have they worked on before? Do they own or lease their equipment? Uh, how much do they make use of third-party contractors and temporary staff? How do they treat for mold, bacteria, all of those types of concerns? And be sure to ask for three references from institutions similar to your own. It used to be maybe a little bit more difficult to do that, but now with as many disasters as are happening, we probably have easy references that people can give, and they probably are fairly recent as well, uh, because we are having all sorts of situations like this and all sorts of situations with uh, the kind of thing uh, Jan talked about in Western Kentucky. You know, they call that a no notice event, and I have been seeing some level of the newspaper and uh, internet articles on the wildfires in Hawaii being called no notice events as well because they happen so quickly. And um, in, in some cases, many people said that some of the emergency alarm systems uh, didn't uh, work in Hawaii or uh, were not able to reach everyone. And so there was not notice. And that's why people had to uh, try to get out of the area so quickly and why we unfortunately have had uh, a number of fatalities in those incidents. So securing a vendor before the incident is important, but being sure to get a written contract in the event of a disaster. What will be done, what processes and materials will be used, 
um, where will things go? I had one librarian who said, 30,000 of my books disappeared. I don't know where they went to. And it was because the other 120,000 went to one warehouse that was close by, but that warehouse ran out of space. So they had to ship the other ones to another warehouse 200 miles away. And the, uh, the record keeping wasn't so great on anybody's part. So they needed to be able to track that. I'm going to take a look at uh, the uh, questions. Will insurance cover vendor fees? I am going to get to that in one minute, but um, in many cases uh, that it will, um, but you need to look at what your insurance policy covers. And so I am going to uh, cover that um, in a, a slide in just a minute. And I'm actually going to ask you about uh, have you all do some homework about uh, insurance in just a minute as well. So uh, let's keep that question in mind. And on the next slide, this is probably the most important thing I think that you can think of. Um, this is your salvage priorities. Um, I think we've said this before in this series of workshops, and I know we're gonna say it again, you probably can't save everything. Um, so what do you want to have as your biggest priority? And here are some things to consider when you're establishing those salvage priorities. Health and human safety must be the number one priority every time. I always have said, I don't care if you have the Gutenberg Bible, you need to think about your staff and your patrons first. However, I did get in a little bit of trouble when I went to an organization that had a copy of the Gutenberg Bible and they gave me side eye glances and said, now, wait a minute here. But they agreed with me too. They said, yes, our staff is definitely the first thing to uh, that we want to take care of. Those irreplaceable items, can you decide which items in your building are irreplaceable items? I've worked recently with an organization who was having all sorts of building problems, and they said, well, we got concerned and we did some searches on uh, some of the databases like OCLC and other things to see what our unique items were. And they said, we had about 400 to 500 unique items in our relatively large library that we wanted to make sure we kept because we are the uh, holder of last resort of those items. So what is irreplaceable? Um, and be able to uh, get that type of information ready for working with your disaster team, ready for working with your vendors. Um, you should consider the availability of services and workers to assist. And so that whole idea of getting in touch with them ahead of time is going to be very important. Um, marking the priority areas in the specific department or floor that you're in, put that on your floor plans, put that on any map of your building, you know, a star or an asterisk next to it and say, recover this first. Um, so that's important. I've even had an organization that said, we can replace many of our general collection things, but we have some special collections items and some, some rare books that we page out to patrons. And they put reflective glow-in-the-dark tape on those shelves. And about three years after they did that, they had a fire. And after they talked with the uh, fire department uh, members afterwards, the fire department folks said, we had visited your place ahead of time. We knew that we needed to be looking for that reflective tape. And that is one of the places we went the first. And that's why we got those materials out. We packed those pieces of artwork and those materials out. So establishing where the priorities are is important. And, you know, this is um, not an item by item prioritization, but it's by area or type of material. Um, so it's the type of asset. You'll, you may have photographs that are unique and you'll want to have those be uh, one of your big priorities, or it might be in a certain area of your building. And so marking with the levels of prioritization um, is important. The other thing is reviewing your priorities. They're gonna change. Um, we've had a number of arts organizations that have closed or merged um, since the pandemic, and uh, they have, may have more materials that are coming in, archival materials that they need to deal with and think about. So um, once your priorities have been outlined, they need to be reviewed. Um, I would say, 
here's a review schedule for you. Maybe once a year or when your organization mission changes, when you add new services or new collections or a new department, or when there are renovations to your building. Um, I've worked in buildings where I swear that they change the floor plan every year by moving all sorts of dividers and uh, you know uh, temporary walls around. And that meant that every year we had to change the map uh, and the floor plans as well. The other thing I'd say is review them after each disaster. Review your priorities after each disaster. Did you learn that it was very difficult for the fire department to get some of your materials out and for conservators to deal with them? That might go closer to the top of the salvage priority list. And be sure to update the floor plans, your prioritization, and your recovery, recovery list at least annually as well. So let me take a look here at the Q&A for just one second. Um, can you comment on using Servpro for paper-based collection recovery? Um, sure, I will answer that. Um, I have uh, worked with uh, Servpro. This is actually a, um, uh, a first-person story that I can uh, tell here. Um, my father was an English professor, and he had way too many books in our house. And actually, at one point, uh, the house was uh, empty for a while while the, uh, my parents were traveling, and they had a water pipe leak. And um, there were probably five to 10,000 books in our basement that got damaged. Um, and because we didn't have some of these uh, library specific companies that we uh, could work with, um, we called our local ServPro uh, organization. And ServPro often is known for um, apartment cleaning, uh, house you know, cleanup, um, do, doing work on furniture, that type of thing. Um, and uh, ServPro did a good job. We lost one book due to mold damage out of five or 10,000 of them. But um, it was, uh, it, it's important to think about this. Uh, this is where if you have a ServPro that might be closer in reach to you than some of the other organizations we've talked about, ask them what type of Library Archive Historical Society experience they have. Um, ask them if they have worked on collections of art or cultural material. I think those are important questions to ask, and it's certainly something that you could um, uh, do in your preliminary research. So, um, uh, you know, think about that. I think very good in some cases for smaller personal collections, but for some of the larger scale collections, um, they may not have um, some of the vacuum freeze drying facilities. They may not have um, uh, access to uh, the uh, uh, conservators uh, that other people might have. Elena, I'm going to ask you real quickly, do you have any other responses to that question um, about uh, utilizing ServPro or uh, some of the other um, organizations that might be uh, uh, geographically a little more dispersed? I The only insight I have into that is that I know that ServPro is a franchise-based organization, so they're you can expect different things at different locations um, where Belfour is a national organization. So it's more uniform across the country. Um, that doesn't mean one is better than the other. It just, it's a different approach to how they set up their offices. Um, but I have had good experiences with both. So not much. And same with Polygon and BMS CAD. There's a lot of good options. Definitely. And some of the, thank you, Elena, some of the big disasters that we've been talking about today, all three of those companies, plus ServPro, plus, you know, other groups have had to pitch in because there are such large collections that have been damaged. So I want to talk about insurance and financial resources, and this could be, and in some cases should be, a, a session of its own. Um, we've had some really good uh, speakers from some insurance companies who can talk about collections, and I would say um, that might be a person to get in touch with ahead of time as well. I'm going to ask you a question. And that is how many of you, and we can add this in the chat if we want to, could put your hands on your insurance policy today after this class. Um, if you could do that, 
please indicate if you can by putting a note in the chat that says, I know my insurance details. And let's see what happens with the, uh, if there are uh, anybody who uh, adds to chat here, because I know this is something that a lot of people don't have uh, the uh, response and uh, the ability to, to work with. So um, we've got a couple of people. Uh, I can reach my insurance details. This is good. This is a really uh, prepared group all the way through the questions. Um, that's good. So my business manager does. I know my details. I know where the paper policy is and where it cover what it covers. This is good. Um, for those of you who have not answered that, please think about going back and asking some questions around your place um, and uh, uh, see at your organization who has this and uh, could be um, uh, able to to get it to you. Because in some cases your insurance company make decisions about how and what to recover. They may make some decisions on who you can use. So it's important to know what kind of insurance you have and what it covers. Do you have specialized policies such as event cancellation or business interruption insurance? Do you have for some of those really important things in your collection, um, museum piece uh, uh, type of uh, uh, policies on maybe some of your most unique uh, materials? Talk with your insurance companies ahead of time. I'm sounding like a broken record, but talk with them ahead of disasters and get to know your agent Ask them to go through your building, just like you should with police, fire, and the disaster recovery vendors, and talk about ways to reduce risks. That is some way that you can even save some money. Even if you can't afford sprinklers in your building, your insurance rates might be able to go down a little bit if you can prove to the insurance company that you're taking other measures to mitigate disasters. Measures like security, disaster recovery drills, maybe getting some more fire extinguishers, um, thinking about other changes that you could make to make your building safer. So having another walkthrough, you probably don't want to have everybody on the same walkthrough because they're really, they'll be firing so many questions at you um, that it'll be difficult. But think about the idea of having some separate walkthroughs, including your insurance person. Your state and local emergency management groups will work with FEMA to distribute money to affected locales. It's important to know that FEMA is not there instead of insurance, but as a supplement, and you need to go through your insurance companies first. Um, additional funding can come from a variety of sources, but it's rarely enough to meet all your needs. The government can provide loans after a disaster through the Small Business Administration, and there may be some emergency grants through organizations like the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, all these groups, though, have different requirements for the distribution of funding. So the other thing is all of these sources are going to require documentation. So make sure you document as much as you can in the event of a disaster. Let me take a look here because we got another question in the Q&A. Insurance companies are pulling out of high disaster areas, i.e. Florida. Do you have any advice as this becomes a reality for us all? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a, a reason for you to definitely have um, a, a good relationship and start talking with your insurance organization right away. Um, I know that uh, there were people who said, oh, uh, uh, they have pulled out of our area, they pulled out of our region or state, but we had some level of advance warning. Um, my concern is that what happens if an area becomes an insurance desert and um, there is not an ability to uh, get any type of insurance. So I think, you know, one of the things is, yes, look at your policy every once in a while, review it and see what it covers, but also think about doing maybe a little bit of plan B shopping for other insurance vendors, because I think that this is going to happen potentially along the Atlantic seaboard. I think this is going to happen along the Gulf Coast. So we do need to be prepared for it. That is a really good and sort of future forward type of question. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so 
I think that uh, if we can, uh, again, do some homework before our uh, August 29th session, and if you don't know your insurance company details, see if you can find them. Um, so I think that will be a good direction to go. Now, disaster supplies. Just a couple more things here, and then we will round out uh, our time and go to our questions and answers. But I'm going to move to talk briefly um, about disaster supplies. You should definitely aim to have enough supplies to last for 24 to 48 hours of a larger disaster, or until more supplies can be shipped, or enough to fully take care of yourself if you have a smaller emergency or disaster. I think that it's best to have designated disaster supplies, as Elena said earlier, um, you know, label them, keep them in a separate area. Um, but uh, some things that are not designated might have to be used in non-disaster times as well, like a wet, dry vacuum. You might see uh, that being used. Um, from experience of a library I worked with, do not store these supplies in your basement. Uh, there was a library who had a flood and they saw their uh, supply, uh, they had their supplies in trash cans and the trash cans were floating in and taking on water in the basement because the basement got flooded in Houston. This was a couple of years ago. Um, so think about that. Some of the disasters, uh, disaster supplies might be supplied by a vendor that's under contract with your institution, such as generators. Um, when I was working in Houston after uh, the uh, Hurricane Harvey situation, um, there were generator trucks that were driving through the streets and pulling up to buildings. Um, they were really loud and I needed to have earplugs when I was outside because the generator trucks were going. So that's an important thing to think of. We do have a uh, recommended supply list uh, that's linked here uh, that's on the Lyricist website. I know that there are a number of other supply lists that FAIC um, and other organizations have. So think about that. That might be a good place to get started and think about the uh, link on this slide. You'll need other materials for salvage, but it's hard to estimate your needs until you have a disaster. I think that having Enough materials to work on, say, 200 items is a good direction to go. And to show you a little bit more about that, let's go to the next slide. This next slide, we've talked about PPE and safety, and you'll see some of those things here. Um, and we talked about cleaning, paper towels, uh, and all of those type of uh, things, heavy-duty trash bags. The documentation, even having the type of things that you can use to document the disaster um, in your kit are important. And then packing and uh, polyethylene sheeting. Uh, and, uh, you know, can you get something that's made out of chloroplast like this? Um, there are ready-made disaster supply kits like this disaster recovery kit that's shown on the slide. And they're available from Gail uh, University Products and Gaylord Archival and others. These include some of the basics like a mop, a bucket, sponges, plastic sheeting. I think it can be cheaper to buy everything individually, but it really is easier to buy them in a cube or buy them in a pre-assembled package like this. I think the list on this slide is pretty good to consider even, uh, especially if you're developing your own disaster kit. So with those ideas in mind, we have one more question and I'm going to hand things back to Jan. Um, how often would you suggest supply lists be updated and replenished? Six months or yearly? I would say at least yearly. Um, although if you're having disasters, if you're having flooding in your area, um, every six months is not bad. Um, I have been talking to a couple of people in California in the um, Central Valley, and they said that they're looking really even on a seasonal basis to think about, have we run out of these supplies? Um, what do we need to do here? So um, yearly as the max, and uh, more often, I think, if you're having more problems than that. So I am going to uh, see where we are with uh, the chat here. Um, and uh, yes, in the chat, uh, there's also another link to uh, the, uh, the, the piece that we have there. But 
I'll turn things over to Jan for our opportunity to sort of close the session and start taking your questions. And we can do that in chat or Q&A. Jan. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Elena. A lot of good information and wonderful questions. So keep those questions coming. We have uh, until 11.30 Eastern, uh, I believe. And I just wanted to, again, point out our organizations and our contact information on that last slide. We're available for you. If you have questions that come up and you hadn't thought of it before, it, you know, it's it's fine for us to be contacted by you. We're happy, happy to have that uh, interaction. And uh, as I said, this is our second uh, uh, webinar in a series. The next one is in two weeks, August 29th, and we're going to talk about disaster recovery and getting back to business. And then two weeks after that, September 12th, we have disaster resilience and mitigation and preparing for the next time because there will be, I'm sure, an another time that we'll have to be being prepared for. So please, if you have questions, uh, we will, we're here to answer them and we're happy to do so. I see a good uh, tip uh, in the webinar chat from Shelly, replace emergency kits every six months when the time changes. That's a really good way to think about it. Oh, yeah. And check your smoke alarms. That is really good. I was uh, in a building a couple of days ago. It wasn't a library or archive. It was another building. And they said, uh, you know, it's a pain. We have to get up on a ladder to do it. Uh, but we uh, do this fairly often because we would rather have the batteries replaced than the noise going off in the middle of the night. Um, so uh, that's important. almost dying from carbon monoxide oh. poisoning as has occurred in I had an office in an old building and the architect owner said, oh, I checked everything out. Well, flu was, was clogged and um, we, we were in a bad way for a while. So it's important to do those things and have those um, all monitored. And I like mm -hmm. the idea of the, having that kit um, through now, I was born to buy retail anyway, but um, you know, having it all together means that you're not going to pilfer it and on a daily basis. You know, it's in its own little uh, uh, cube, and I I think that when especially if you have a lot of people going in after supplies, that um, that would be a hands off kind of situation, and possibly meaning that it will be there when you need it. That's great. I, I no, I definitely agree, uh, Jan, with that type of um, you know getting prepared and uh, having the kit around. You might say, "Well, I invested in this kit, but I haven't used it." But I think we're going to have more and more opportunities to use it. And one of the things that Elena, Jan, and I have all, already talked about in our first session is the idea of networking for disasters and working collaboratively. You might not use it on your disaster, but you might be able to help uh, another uh, fellow fellow institution, uh, you know, in your area. So I got a question. Do your organizations offer any on-site individualized trainings or do you know organizations that do? And um, certainly I can say from uh, the uh, arts area that uh, performing arts readiness does offer on-site uh, training uh, for organizations. We oftentimes ask them if they will uh, invite neighboring organizations in their city or region so that as many people as possible um, uh, can, can do it. Um, uh, or do we know organizations that do? Um, Lyricis, uh, our parent organizations for PAR, uh, do, uh, uh, does offer this for libraries, archives, and museums as well. Um, Elena, I know, uh, has uh, some uh, resources through FAIC, uh, but also knows everybody and anybody who offers this kind of training too. So... Uh, yeah, we often, so the trainings that we provide are intended to support Alliance for Response Networks. So we often plan them several years out. Um, like for example, right now we know we're doing trainings um, for the next three years in Boston, Charleston, New Orleans, and Philadelphia. 
Um, so it is a, a long planning process. Um, and we're able to do that thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, but yeah, there are many organizations that provide this type of training as well. Um, I know NEDCC, uh, sorry, the Northeast Document, the Northeast Document Conservation Center <laughs> um, and uh, the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, CCAHA. I'm based on the East Coast, so I'm, my reference is Eastern based, but I know that there's many organizations that provide training. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, we have uh, the idea of um, the kits uh, design just in time. Uh, definitely, um, you know, putting those uh, together uh, is is very helpful. And uh, Shelley mentioned here, local emergency management can conduct training on personal and business emergency plans and kits, but they don't have specific info on arts and cultural preparedness. Um, I think that that is great, and it may be a little bit easier uh, to get those uh, easier and quicker talk with your police department with your fire department um uh, about this kind of thing and uh you know uh, we don't like to talk about it but we did in our first class um active shooter training um is there active shooter training that uh can be done so um with that in mind i think we are about ready to wrap up and uh we can move on to our closing from here uh, as Jan mentioned, we'll see you all again on the 29th for our next session. Uh, but thanks to Kentucky Humanities and thanks to all of you. Everybody's been really engaged and you've had some great answers to our questions and really uh, uh, added a lot to Elena's uh, tabletop today. So thank you very much. Thanks to Jan, Tom and Elena for their insights and to our sponsor, the National Endowment for the Humanities and to the many individuals and organizations that shared photos and video footage, our sincere appreciation. We also wanna thank you for joining us for this Disaster Preparedness Online Series session and encourage you to fill out our survey immediately following this event. If you're interested in reviewing the information covered in today's session, you'll be able to find a recording at kyhumanities.org or on our Kentucky Humanities YouTube channel. For Kentucky Humanities, I'm Bill Goodman.